Hello and welcome everyone. We're delighted that you're joining us for uh, the first of a three-part series, which is exciting for us. We have a lot to pack into 30 minutes, so I'm going to try to be more brief than I usually am. And um, just to quickly say, I'm Leslie Esslinger I'm here with Beckers, along with our team, Kathy, Rob, Terry, Marilyn, all here to help make sure things go smoothly for us today. Uh, just to remind you that this is the first of three parts, and today is focused on diversity and inclusion. Uh, lots of you will be interested to know that we do handle our series a bit differently than our other one-part workshops, so it's very hard to manage the certificates. We will be giving out a one and a half hour certificate to all of those who are able to attend the live sessions, all three live sessions. Um, we still will have recordings available. We hope that you are interested enough in the content and maybe you don't even need credits at this point in the year that you will still find a way to enjoy them, even if you're not able to attend every single live event. Um, we, at the end, we have a link to some additional resources that will be great for you to have at shopbecker.com. The chat box is always open for you to present questions. Uh, we are going to see at the end if we have time to answer some of those questions. If not, we will find another way to get responses to you because I know our presenter, Lisa, definitely wants to be able to take care of anything that's on your minds. And um, at the very end of the presentation, we will have an evaluation, which is part of the requirements of any webinar that we do. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Lisa, my favorite task. We're very pleased to introduce you to Lisa Heinz. She is an experienced music educator with 20 years as a teacher and coach from pre-K to grade five, and there she is, a beautiful smile, with some time spent teaching at the college level. More recently, Lisa has found a creative way to combine her interest in children's literature, music, and brain-based approaches to teaching and share them with educators through her website, Little Songbird. You'll hear more about that and the fantastic collection of related resources she has amassed at the end of this session. And you'll want to visit her website, which is graced with many lovely quotes such as you're seeing here on the slide right now. What we find most impressive about Lisa and the reason we are so excited to have her here today is because of the passion and heartfelt love she has for this topic. Please help me welcome Lisa warmly, as this is the first time she's presenting a live webinar for Beckers while under the threat of rolling blackouts in her area due to heat and storms. So we are all keeping our fingers and toes crossed that we will get through this presentation without Lisa dealing with a blackout. And with that, Lisa, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. That was a great introduction. And yes, the weather looks great, but the heat is so awful here that uh, we've had quite a lot of uh, uh, outages. And so I've, I've got my cell phone. So if I disappear, I will rejoin you right away. Um, anyway, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. We are going to be talking about opening the circle. So using music to foster diversity and inclusion in your classroom. And it is a topic about which I'm very, very passionate. Um, so thanks and let's get started because I know I have way more to say than I probably have time for. So um, if you think of it, I would, I would like just a little feedback from you about how or why music is important to you in your classroom. So um, it doesn't have to be long or you know anything, just a quick, why, why you use it or why you don't use it if, you, if you're not using much music in the classroom. So give me a little feedback on that and let's move on to this song. I, I know you heard, some of you heard this song as it was playing before everyone joined, but we're gonna hit it one more time. And if you heard it, please feel free to join in. I, true, wait, true confession, I am not a singer. So don't get excited. You're not gonna be wowed. I'm no Barbara Streisand. It's just me singing um, and, uh, and you know you have to be on mute, otherwise we all get jumbled. So here we go. Oops, lost it. Hold on. There we, there we went. <laughs> yeah, hold on. Come on. Oh, I 
right. Thank you. Up in the, the circle, the time has come. Open the circle for everyone. It's my circle without a doubt. We'll keep it open until nobody's left out. That's it. That's okay. That's the highlight of the song. It's the meat of the presentation today, opening the circle and keeping everyone uh, included and engaged. So um, if you could forward that slide for me. Um, we wanna talk about the objectives for this presentation. And of course, why incorporating music into your daily curriculum and why it needs to be more than just fluff or filler is so critical. We need to talk about your role in creating that music and that successful, uh, successful music experience for all children in your classroom, how you're going to manage your expectations and um, sometimes manage those of the children, and then how to plan effectively to get more music and movement that's culturally relevant, it's inclusive and educational, and of course, most importantly, fun for you as well as for the children. So the reason I talk about opening the circle is because in the circle, everyone is equal. When you're in the circle, there's no one ahead of you, no one more important than you. Um, everyone is, uh, has equal balance and the sacred circle is designed to create unity. Now that is a quote on the screen from Oglala Sioux Lakota, um, Dave Yakima Chief, that's his name. Um, and I, I just share that with you to create the image of the importance of creating unity through music. So when you, if you can, always seat your children in a circle to do um, shared experiences rather than in the sort of grid or rainbow or you know semicircles, those are okay. But ideally you're gonna always be in a circle that creates that sense of balance and inclusive, inclusivity for everyone. So why do we use music? And I'm seeing lots of great answers over here in the chat. And when, that's great. Um, transition time, circle times, Warming up, engaging, that's good. Oh, music teacher, okay, more ideas, that's great. So um, calm and excite, I love that. Uh, music can calm and excite, yes. It can work both ways and that's one of the beautiful things about it. So let's talk about the seven whys whys, <laughs> why we use music in the classroom. Number one, because of the impact it has on the brain. Music is one of the few, um, areas in which all parts of your brain, not all, but both hemispheres of your brain are used um, fairly equally. It also speeds up sound processing development, which is imperative for both hearing and listening. Um, and it increases neuron development, which I'm sure you know at, at a young age particularly is critical for um, early learning and later learning. So the more neurons we can create and develop, um, the more firing of neurons goes on, the better um, the, better the child will be able to uh, develop mentally, cognitively, physically in all those areas. And it improves coordination and speed of movement, which is an amazing thing, and language, as I'm sure many of you know, and also the ability to analyze. So being critical thinkers, that's a, that's a very important skill. So number two, Music evokes emotion. So this is one of the most important things about music. If you can hook a child, any listener actually, if you can hook someone emotionally, then you have them. If you try to hook them with something that doesn't engage their emotions, the truth is they're not likely to retain the information nearly as well. So you can boost self-confidence, you can increase energy. As someone mentioned in the chat, you can decrease energy and calm as well. Um, physiologically, it lowers your cortisol, which is the stress hormone. And by releasing those endorphins, um, you actually naturally can reduce stress. So you may have heard that, that, that music is often used in 
healing and therapy and even in surgical situations. Um, that's because it has that capacity to, um, to naturally reduce stress. And who doesn't need less stress, right? I, I could use it. I'm sure our children could use it too. Um, of course, it also addresses anxiety and depression because it can adjust your mood. And um, beyond, it, it provides a safe and productive means of expressing children, ex children expressing themselves that help them manage stress. And that is a coping strategy that actually moves beyond the classroom. And ideally, that's what all learning is about, something that can be applicable to the rest of your life, not just what happens in the classroom. Well, so this is one of the keen topics here because number three is that music develops social skills. I don't know about you, but my experience in the classroom is that particularly with young children, there are a lot of social skills that need to be developed. And how do they learn that? They learn that through experience. So music brings kids together and it, it actually has a physiological effect of synchronizing the heartbeat. So not that you really wanna test this, but, but you actually could go around and check after singing for maybe 10 or 15 minutes solid. And you would find that everybody's heartbeat, including yours are aligned and beating pretty much the same way. That's how powerful music is. I love that. Um, and because it does unite us and help us feel uh, good and positive about being ourselves and being together, that helps us develop social skills, trust, mutual respect, uh, respect and, and um, the desire to cooperate. Those are all important social skills that can be developed through music. Thank you. Um, and so as an extension of the social emotional music builds community because it promotes and connects us through our culture and our national identity. If you think about um, patriotic music, I don't know how old some of you are, but I'm old enough to have sung um, uh, many patriotic songs every day in my school when I was growing up. I don't think kids do that mostly anymore, but nonetheless, that is part of our cultural heritage. And um, you're going to have children from a variety of places in the world joining your classroom over the years. And so it can help share those national identities with the rest of the class. That helps bond everyone, excuse me, and, and makes it a more in, um, inclusive environment for those children who are not perhaps native to the United States. Um, and also it helps us create then our own little community within the classroom. And that's a beautiful thing. So number five, music promotes positive behavior. So if you think back to how it was impacting social emotional behavior and a sense of community, all of that lifts everyone in the room. That encourages positive growth. You can give constructive feedback. Um, you could even talk about um, things like your volume. You know, boys and girls, I, I noticed that um, today you're you're excited because your voices are super loud today, but you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna let you know that we can calm that down. We can take our volume down just a little bit and still enjoy the song without hurting anyone's ears. So literally, you're able to give some sort of analytic, um, specific feedback on behavior, uh, a wide variety of behaviors that can occur during those group settings. And because it's a positive environment and a positive engaging activity, children take that in in a more positive way. They don't feel um, def deflated or you know, persecuted because something was wrong. You can just bring it up globally um, and talk about it as a group. How can we make our, our music time the most fun for everyone? Um, so that feedback can be very specific. Um, it also promotes inclusion and acceptance of all students. And we all have children with different cultural traditions and needs and interests that can all be explored and addressed through music. Um, and I would encourage you to get parents in on that. If you have, if you particularly if you have families whose culture may have differed, you know, maybe different than that of the majority of the students in the class please invite them in, ask them to help you develop some songs that you could use with the children. It will be one of the most wonderful experiences of uh, parent-teacher experiences you can have. And it creates such a great 
sense of belonging for those specific students whose parents or, or families are able to contribute to. It's a great, it's a win-win for everyone. Um, it also develops um, smooth, smoother transitions and helps children learn rule following and self-control. Think about the freeze dance, those sorts of songs where the children have to listen in order to follow the instructions of the song. That's all positive behavior building. Um, music pr promotes well-being of your physical body. So deeper breathing, anytime you can get children to breathe deeply and to control their breathing is going to help them calm down and be more focused, more centered, and more able to be productive participants in the music activity or any other activity for that matter. Um, it also increases our antibodies yay to boosted immune systems. We all need that. <laughs> um, and it provides aerobic activity, particularly if you're doing movement, of course, involved gross motor movement particularly. Um, so those are all things that help your promote your overall health and physical well-being. Um, and this is such a huge one, and it's the one I'm probably the most excited about is that music directly develops language skills. It is not vicarious, it's not around the corner, it is direct language skill development. So I'm sure you know phonemic awareness, phonics. Um, music really supports English language learners because they can attach a tune to the words. It helps them repeat it mentally, it helps them rehearse it, and then it helps them sing it again. Even if they don't quite know the words, they're, they're getting it, they're experimenting, they're starting to refine the language, and eventually they come to the understanding of what the words mean, uh, <clears throat> particularly when they're joined with movements. And so all of that is really strong language learning uh, opportunity for, for um, sec English second language learners or third language learners. Um, and I, I really want to highlight one thing that the list is really long. You can look at it because you'll have access to, this, to the slides later. I really want to highlight one thing. Steady beat is critical. So you don't know, need to know much about music to know that the beat is the steady part that comes in the song. Da, 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 da. Ba, da, da, da. That's the steady beat. And there has been quite a bit of research that indicates that children who are able to keep a steady beat are actually best prepared to be readers by the time they're five. That doesn't mean they're reading at five, but it does mean that if they can keep a steady beat, then they will be best prepared for reading. That's a pretty phenomenal statement to be made, but there's quite a bit of research that supports that. And all you have to do is incorporate simple songs and highlight that beat. Open the circle, it's that simple. And you don't have to have all the children clapping all the time, just highlight it once in a while, pick a different song and say, what's the beat to this song? And then just practice singing it that way. Or of course you could flap your wings, you could pat your thighs, whatever. Um, but developing that sense of steady beat is critical for early reading development. So in all of that, that's a lot. <laughs> what is your role as the educator what can you do to make all of this happen magically and simply? Let's see. <laughs> the most important thing you do, and I can't understate this. <laughs> I can't overstate this, pardon me. The most important thing that you do is model. You are modeling to set the tone for what your expectations are. You're modeling to set the, um, the sense of uh, mood? Are you, are you setting a quiet, calming mood? Are you setting an energetic, excited, let's get up and jazz it mood? Or something in between? You are absolutely modeling your relationship with music. So I'm speaking directly to those of you who are a little worried because you don't think you have a great voice. <laughs> 
I've already um, thrown myself under the bus. I, I know I can sing okay, but I'm not a singer per se. That's okay. What's most important is that you set that aside in order to model a positive relationship with music. And I'm focusing on singing because that's what we do in early childhood. Most of you are not guitar teachers or piano instructors, and you're not doing that in your classroom. You're singing, right? Um, and so that's what you can model is a positive, happy relationship with singing. And when you do that for children, you set them up for successful singing experiences for the rest of their lives. Unlike a piano or, or any other instrument, you don't, it's free. You can sing everywhere and anywhere. And I think everyone should, I really do. So model what you want to see that relationship look like for the children. If you want them to be excited about singing, regardless of whether they're on pitch or too fast or slow, you have to model a sense of comfort and excitedness about singing for them. If you participate, they'll participate. Please don't find yourself at the back of the room putting on a, a YouTube video and letting the kids sing and dance in the front of the room by themselves. If you want them to do it, you should be doing it too. Okay, so how do you manage your expectations then, knowing that there's a lot, a lot happening? Um, first and foremost, model your respect because if you model respect for the children and their level of comfort with engagement, you're modeling respect for yourself as well. So just give what you want to receive. Um, if you keep in mind that the attention span, of course, is going to be shorter or longer de depending developmentally on the, the group of your children, um, then you don't set them up for failure. If you expect them to be sitting for 15 minutes, but they're only three, that may be too much. So adjust accordingly. Everybody can be uh, successful that way. Um, make sure you've planned well and are streamlined. Have all your materials ready to go so that there isn't downtime for the kids to get squirrely or distracted. Um, plan with intention. You don't need to make this just be the fluff that you play when the kids are coming in or out of the room or background music. You can plan it with more thought and intent to get more successful engagement and, uh, and better outcomes for the students. And then just stay flexible. It's going to change no matter how well you plan, right? The best of plans today can't prevent this from going into a, a rolling outage, even if we're all prepared. <laughs> so life happens. And so plan really well and then be prepared to be flexible. Thanks, I can move on. So how do we address the needs of special learners? And I am, I am currently understanding now that Special learners is maybe not the most appropriate way to describe children uh, with disabilities. I think disabilities is probably the best term, but we all have children whose needs, physical, mental, emotional, um, are varied. And we're gonna have some children who have been diagnosed with something specific. And then we have a lot of children who exempt, uh, who, uh, indicate that they have other needs that may never be identified specifically as a learning disability or a cognitive you know, disability or whatever. So we've got a wide array of children we need to deal with, regardless of whether they come with some specific um, label or not. So this addresses a wide array of children. So if you see signs of stress in children, like kids who are acting out when it's group time or you know, time for singing and music, if they're covering their ears, if they have meltdowns, um, those are all signs that something's wrong. I, I like to remind folks that behavior, even when it's negative behavior, is communication. It's not, um, it's not intended to be a threat to your dominance in the room. It is sending a clear message for the child who may not be able to verbally communicate what's going on for them. So just watch for signs of stress and then try to figure out what's at the root of it. And then what can you do to adjust the learning setting to make it a little bit better for that child? So identifying the keys to success then include figuring out what helps a child be independent, what allows them to be engaged without a lot of one-on-one -on -one assistance, 
what things keep, what activities keep that child the most engaged, um, what helps them be calm or calm themselves, and how can they uh, participate fully, again, without much intervention on other people's part. So that's not always feasible or possible, but those are the things that you're looking to identify so that you can develop a, a plan or a strategy to help each child um, be engaged with minimal intervention, because that's gonna make everybody feel successful. So in, in that regard, then that's okay, you can go on. You want to always focus on finding the least restrictive interventions possible. So you can do simple things, like if you have a child who is you know, covering their ears, they probably have sensitive hearing. They could be seated in a, for a, a, a location a little further away from where the music is happening. They could wear headphones. Um, they could wear earbuds if, that, if that's permissible by their parents, um, just because of the size of them. Sometimes that's not always safe for everyone. But um, you can also, um, excuse me, you can also, for children who need a little visual stimulus, you could provide cue cards that might help them follow the, the, the language or structure of the song or follow the instructions about what's coming next and what we're gonna sing next. Having visual cues for each of those are really a dynamic way to help children who need that um, sense of prediction. They wanna know what's coming next because they feel anxious when they don't know what, what's happening. Um, so uh, there are several things here listed, but the point is to, to do the things that are going to be the least restrictive um, first, and then when those, if those don't work, move on to something that's more restrictive. And that would be seating the child next to you or another adult using hand over hand and, you know, instruction to help children know when to move and how to move, um, recruiting a peer model to help um, do some of those things too. Those are more restrictive because they involve a lot more intervention from someone else. So least restrictive first. Thank you. Okay, so this is just a few simple ideas for um, children who have physical um, handicaps. There are a variety of ways. The thing in the upper left-hand corner is a, is a ch child's bike glove. And those are great for putting on a hand and then you can actually uh, attach um, like, um, <laughs> I, I suddenly lost the name, like you know, a, a, a rhythm instrument. You can attach that by wrapping uh, an ACE bandage or some tape or something around the fingers of the bike glove to help them hold on to something. Um, egg shakers, I have, I've developed a couple of new ways to do egg shakers for kids who have uh, motor dexterity problems. Um, mic stands are really fantastic because you can dangle things like a, a triangle or even a tambourine that they can hit at with a mallet. Um, so there are a number, uh, there are quite a few ways of adapting simple uh, rhythm instruments to help children be able to participate more fully if they have uh, physical uh, handicaps. So, <clears throat> so a few ways that you can diversify the music in order to reach out to those children um, in your classroom who may come from other cultures I would like to encourage you to look first at the classroom and say, who have I got here? What families can I tap to help me um, develop some music that's appropriate for this class? Start with who you have in your classroom first. That's first and foremost. So if you have someone from, we have a friend here from Kuwait. Um, if you have someone in your classroom from another country, engage that family. Um, in you know what what children's music did you learn as a child that you could share with either with me as the teacher that I could share with the children or better yet that the family could come in and share um, with the classroom uh, or recorded music that they may have that's appropriate for children um, and so those are I, I think those are the ideal ways to begin is with what's right in front of you. Um, that said, a lot, of, a lot of us teach in areas where we have maybe a homogenous group where kids are all of one race or ethnicity, and that's okay too. They still need the diversity. It's just that you 
always start with who you have right in your in your classroom right in front of you first and then diversify out so um some ways that you can start integrating different things uh, different types of diverse music is just to find song picture books or um, music that's familiar that may have some like uh, differences in language so you could sing the alphabet in french or um, find a nursery rhyme that has some keywords changed into an into the language of a student in your class those sorts of things um, Lisa, uh, I'm going to actually yes. um, just I'm looking at the time oh, and just to be respectful uh, of those yes. that do have to scoot. Um, and I see some slides that are coming up that are filled with great ideas. Okay. So going. can I scoot to Please the next do. one? OK, great. My apologies, everyone. No problem. Um, OK, so these are just five really cool ideas on ways that you can uh, that you can uh, incorporate some more uh, music experiences. So a focus line. Just put a quick piece of tape on the floor and have uh, play really calming music and have the children walk slowly down the line. Body control, and you can use all kinds of soothing music. It could be world music from other places. That's that's always great. Um, the reverse freeze I love because children have to remain frozen while the music is playing, but then they dance when you stop the music. It's reverse thinking and it's really tricky, but it's so much fun. And again, you can use any kind of music from anywhere in the world for that. It doesn't have to be children's specific children's music. Um, <laughs> or Simon says, this time you use picture cues. So you're holding up a picture of a body part, like an elbow, and then you play the music for 30 or 45 seconds and the children can only dance with that body part. So boop, 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 doop, ba, and you're playing what again, whatever kind of music from anywhere in the world that you'd like to. So that's a, some easy ways to incorporate, I, I call it world music, but that just music from uh, anywhere, <laughs> any kind of genre. If you'd like to go ahead to the next one. Yep, getting there. Here we go. Sorry. And then here's just a simple planner. It's a template. It's in the resource packet. It is not for planning an entire week, but rather just for planning your circle time or your music and movement time. Um, and this is kind of the structure of how I um, use music and movement in my group. I use a gathering song and then the welcome song. I try to incorporate a child choice. So uh, there are a variety of ways that you can in, uh, enable a child from the group to select the song. Um, but I like to include children's choice songs wherever possible. Where it says hook, what I mean by that is simply, what are you going to do to grab their attention? Are you gonna use a prop? Are you gonna use a book? Are you going to use uh, an instrument? Whatever you can do to grab, again, their emotional attention to bring, bring in the focus and uh, keep them engaged. And then I use a lot of interactive charts where the text of a lyric is printed out. Um, pocket charts, if you're not familiar with the term interactive charts, just using pocket charts where the lyrics are printed out and you can put them in the same, in the structure of the song. Children then can engage with those after that group time has ended. They can go back and rearrange the lyrics and sing them differently and continue to engage with the literacy and the print. Um, and then a finger play, I like to incorporate children's choice there. And then my gross movement or dance, and then end with something slow, I call it low and slow, end with something that's gonna slow them down, slow the roll, calm them down a little bit, and then we can move on and transition to the next activity, hopefully with music. Um, and then at the very bottom, just include your materials. That's fine, just all the, all the materials that you're gonna need to, to do that set. So, uh, at this point, I would really like to thank you for keeping up with me and, um, and joining us today. You can see that my contact information here for Little Songbird Songs for Learning is all on their Twitter and Instagram and those things. What I really like to mention is that June 21st coming up is World Music Day. And um, so for today's Becker Music Mini Series folks only, I'm offering a BOGOHO, which is buy one, get one half off, offer on my website, which is Little Songbird, Songs for Learning. There's a code there, BMMS, excuse me, 22, BMMS. So that's Becker's Music Mini Series 22. That's on my website. 
to get one song, get the second one half off. So it's a great deal, a good time to stock up on music for summer or for fall or whatever you've got going on. So thank you all so much for joining and please don't hesitate to reach out with questions because I know we kind of did the speed rush through this. So I'd be happy to answer whatever I can. And don't leave us yet. Uh, I'm Lisa, not. <laughs> that, that was phenomenal. Thank you so much. Um, as promised, we are going to ask you to, to complete our poll, please, um, so that we can continue to do these webinars. It should just take a quick second. I think there might be just three simple questions for you. As soon as we get full participation, we'll end the poll and we're going to um, show you a couple more slides for um, additional information. And hopefully you'll all get back to your classrooms before the, the nappers wake up <laughs> <laughs> or whatever else might be going on if you're on the West Coast and you haven't even had lunch yet. <laughs> And a couple more responses. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all those that are participating in our poll. And we'll, we're gonna wrap that right now and um, move on to, uh, just to let you know, again, you know, I, I don't know how to thank Lisa enough. Um, I, I know it, we were, I felt like we were sitting on her and tying her hands behind her back because she had so much to want to share just on this topic alone. So um, I think we really got a lot out of the last 30 minutes and it's, it's really a lot to try to pack in. So please visit shopbecker.com. We have many materials that will support you introducing um, multicultural music into your classroom and um, also things that really support you being very inclusive when you have a music program. Um, it's unbelievable to me that that music programs in elementary schools aren't at the priority list of budgeting when we heard all those incredible benefits. So uh, we also have links to access what everybody's been interested in. We will have a PDF of Lisa graciously agreed to let her slides be available to you. So we will have a PDF of that on this at this link, which you see on the slide and which um, will be also put into the chat box. So access that for a recording. And I will repeat to the, anybody that did come on a little bit late, in this case, for a series, we are only able to give a certificate of attendance for a full one and a half hours if you are able to attend all three sessions live. And then same time, same place next week. Don't miss it. And this is really going to be chock full of different um, ideas, finger plays, movement ideas that you'll be able to use immediately. Um, just that one slide that has uh, had those four or five games, Lisa. I mean, they were all so fun and variations on different things we've all done, but really fun to kind of, you know, perk up our music program. So thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, as far as questions, so any of you that have to run, you know, we fully understand, but if you can stay for a few minutes, it sounds like Lisa's willing to do that to see if she can answer a couple questions. Is that good with you, Lisa? Absolutely. And I just wanted to mention, if you go to my Facebook page, uh, the little songbird songs for learning, I'm actually putting up some pictures of adaptive instruments. Oh, great, so, great, great. So there, that. There's that link again, if anybody needs to see that. So um, Marilyn or Terry, let's see, any questions that we can, oh, okay, that has something to do with technical difficulties. We'll get the invite. There were oh. a couple of questions I saw about um, how to do the survey if you're like driving. <laughs> people who are involved. oh dear oh dear <laughs> well that's okay um that's a legitimate excuse we really eyes on the road hands on the road hands on the wheel <laughs> eyes on the road um and then great great question about using the same link yes when you registered you automatically registered for all three sessions um just as this week you will again get a reminder i, th I think i'll set it up so you get a reminder the day before again and an hour before which will once again have give you the link. So great, great questions. We don't want you to miss anything. 
Leslie, is it the same link or will it be a new one for the next? It's the same link. Same yeah. link. Okay. Yep. That answers a couple of people's questions. Yep, 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 yep. So um, I think we are good. Oh my gosh. We we had so much engagement. Uh, some, If I can quickly scroll through, there was one really great comment. Oh, somebody mad way back here. Let's see. <laughs> good luck finding that. Strolling, strolling, strolling. <laughs> Uh, let's see, Marilyn Terry did oh, I'm a really great glad job. to know that the, the timing of the class worked for a number of people. That's yeah, great. yeah, and that's always one of our greatest challenges. Oh, here, it's Thank JP, you. let's see, this is from Joan, and and I forget where you were in your presentation, Lisa, but I, I said, um, she said, we start by just listening, then humming, then swaying to songs. I just love that. I love that. Isn't I've that, never tried that, but that's fantastic. Isn't that lovely? Having yes. singing and dancing together will motivate yes. them and then pull away from dancing to solely singing works for our four to five-year-olds. That's And brilliant. participation is always voluntary, which I, I imagine yes. Lisa would agree that that's really yes. important to give children that message. Mm -hmm. um, some are just not ready for this type of input. So, you know, the, the comments you put in the chat just enrich our webinar so much because obviously you are all out there living this, doing this, having these experiences. And I just am so appreciative that you do uh, share them with everybody that's here. Um, and someone asked, uh, Lisa Glazer asked, is it best to sing with a recording or a cappella? So my initial answer is it's best to sing a cappella. And the reason being, a lot of even children's music is actually too fast. A lot of songs go way too quickly for children to be able to follow along or do gestures and movements. So ideally you do it a cappella because then you're in control of how fast or slow the song goes or when you pause for something. So I think that's that's ideal. That said, if you're not comfortable with it, it is better to use recorded music than none at all. <laughs> so uh, always aim for uh, learning the songs well enough to be able to do them um, uh, you know, independently a cappella, but uh, also because you're modeling that music goes with you everywhere you go. You don't have to have iTunes or YouTube or any of that in order to make music, but use recorded music whenever, whenever you need it and whenever it seems to support your work. Great. And I just in, uh, I know that some of um, our participants needed to leave, but also I think some of our, our team needs to leave as well. So I think <laughs> what we're going to do is they have other meetings, but okay. um, there were a couple questions that I, I know that we'll get to Lisa and Lisa is very interested in, as I said at the beginning, making sure that everybody gets responses. So we will either post them on the landing page, that link that you have um, at the end of all three sessions, we'll be able to do a full list of questions that we didn't have time to address. So again, thank you so much for being here. We really look forward, Lisa, it was tremendous. And we look forward to seeing yeah. everybody next week and hopefully under cooler weather conditions. <laughs> A little less treacherous. <laughs> All right, everyone. Have a great week and be safe and sing.